Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. This webinar is brought to you by Chagask in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland. My name is Pat Murphy, Head of Environment and Knowledge Transfer in Chagask, sitting in for Mark Gibson while he takes some well-earned leave. I'm joined today by Eddie Burgess, catchment specialist. Uh, he will be asking the questions. Good morning, Eddie. You might like turn off your uh, mute and, and join us there. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing uh, the, the webinar coming up now. Thanks very much, Pat, for asking me to be here. Um, this week saw the publication of the EPA uh, Water Quality Indicators Report for, for 2020. So it, it's timely then, that I think, that we're joined by today's guests, Noel Meehan, Asset Manager uh, with Chagask, and Joe Crockett from D Dairy Sustainability Ireland, to, to give us an update on ASAP, water quality restoration, and some broader sustainability issues. And I think uh, just to quote a little bit from the, the beginning of that, of that report uh, in, on the summary of it, it said surface waters and groundwater is continuing to be under pressure from human activity, particularly from nitrogen and phosphorus uh, from agriculture and, and urban waste uh, water discharge. There are some improvements in the biological quality of our rivers. However, uh, many are not as ecologically healthy as they should be. Focused action is needed to see sustained uh, improvement in, in, in water quality, which is essential for ongoing uh, uh, health and, and well-being. Uh, Joe and, or sorry, Noel and, and Joe, I suppose once again, the, the challenge is, is being put to agriculture to, to take action. Uh, are we in a position to start taking that action? Yeah, Noel. I suppose it's uh, like the, indicate, the EPA indicator report was out there during the weekend. Uh, yeah, look, at I suppose, um, unfortunately, we're we're not where we need to be with regards to water quality. Um, I think uh, certainly, you know, there's, there's a lot of building blocks that have been put in place to try and tackle the water quality issue. I suppose ASAP is, is one of those steps, but the, the River Basin Management Plan, the second one, I think into the third one as well, you know, that there's certainly um, strong plans put, being put in place uh, to, to deliver on improvements in water quality. As, and the ASAP is part of that plan, um, along with many other aspects as well. So look at it. I think you know we are, are we are we getting are, are we getting some improvements? Yes, I think the, the indicators report indicated that there was some improvements coming, but uh, we certainly need to uh, upscale or up upscale and uh, drive it on as, as as fast as we can. Twenty twenty seven isn't that far away. Um, whether we meet the targets for twenty twenty seven or not, but we certainly need to have the trends going in the right direction. So, Noel, if you want to take it away. Thanks, Pat, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk this morning. Um, so I'm uh, the ASAP manager with Chagask, and I suppose just before we get into the presentation, um, ASAP is a, is, a, is a very large-scale collaboration across a number of people, and I just want to acknowledge uh, all those people that are involved in the ASAP, uh, the co-ops, um, the biting uh, advisors and, and, and funding towards it, and also uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage, um, and our colleagues there in Law Pro, uh, the Local Authorities Awards Programme, and also Dairy Sustainability Ireland, who, who also provide some funding. So I think it's, it's as you can see, it's, a, it's quite a broad scale um, collaboration, and uh, you know, I think it's, it's all the stronger because of that. So um, I suppose just for those who may not be where what the ASAP is, it's only one slide just to give a brief kind of a background of what it is. And sorry, most of you probably know this already, but just for those who maybe don't, that um, what the ASAP is, it stands for the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory Program. Um, the focus is on water quality, and we're, wor we're working in what they call 100 uh, priority areas for action. There's 100, 190 of those dotted throughout the country. Um, and what we do is we provide a free um, farm, sort of, uh, farm advisory service to farmers and it's, it's a confidential uh, service and well, uh, acceptance of the service is voluntary as well. A farmer can choose to accept it or not. There are 30 advisors working on the programme. Chagas are providing 20 and as I, as I referenced uh, earlier on, there's, there's 10 in the dairy co-ops uh, as well. 
Um, in, in fact, in fairness to the dairy co-ops, there, there are plans there to expand their number of, of advisors working in the uh, in the ASAP. So I think that's a very positive indicator from the from the dairy co-ops that you know they're they're going to add to their their uh, complement of ASAP advisors. We work in collaboration with Law Pro, as I said before, so the local authorities' waters program, and under the Water Framework Directive. Uh, the, the whole reason why we're here is, is, is because of the Water Framework Directive and trying to get all waters to that good status target, which I suppose is, is four star water quality. Um, and what Law Pro do is, is they provide the, the catchment science. They're the guys that get into the guys and, and, and ladies that get into the into the rivers and uh, do this, do the death studies, gather all the information, try and identify the pressures and where these the locations of the pressures are uh, where they are within a in a PAA, and um, provide that information to us. So we spent a lot of work, um, not a lot of time, in the last eighteen months with with our colleagues in Norfolk, developing and making making that system of referral to ourselves and reporting that we would do back to them uh, with regards to issues and, and pressures identification. That uh, you know that we we we've really strengthened that and, and made a and made a better job of made it more. Um, Fit for purpose, and you know the whole program is benefiting on the back of that. So you know the the lockdown uh, provides us with that opportunity to to really really uh, improve on that. So a good bit of work done there over the last eighteen months, and um, I suppose the the ASAP um, advisor contacts the farmer offering the service. So that, that's our once we get those referrals from Law Pro, uh, it's up to us to go and contact the relevant farmers, offer the service, and see what we can do for them. So um, I suppose just a few highlights or a few uh, a few figures, facts and figures. Um, unfortunately, that there's going to be a lot of these uh, in in my presentation, a lot of figures and numbers. But look, bear with me. I think it's all good information, and I suppose maybe just indicates the amount of information that ASAP is collecting and gathering. Um, so to the end of December 2020, we've 1,810 completed farm assessments nationally, and I suppose no more than any other. Any other industry, any other um, sector of society, the, the uh, COVID-19 impacted severely on our ability to visit farms during 2020 and even into the first quarter of, of 2021 as well. Um, but thankfully, um, things have improved uh, with that and we're, we're able to get out and visit farms now. Although I suppose we have to keep an eye on, on the current numbers and, and variants and so on um, and see what comes, comes from that. Um, we have follow-up visits where we go back out and try and visit, see what level of implementation has occurred. So there's 391 of those. Um, the, positive, the engagement of farmers is still quite high, and which is great to see. And that figure hasn't really changed a whole lot. 96% uh, of farmers are engaging with the ASF advisors when we contact them. So, you know, we, we, we had felt that that may slip a little bit. Um, it's still holding, but uh, we, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that into the future. Um, but it's a good, it's a, I think it's a, a very positive indicator that farmers are willing to engage in water quality issues and, and, and aren't afraid to, to have somebody on their farm looking at things. Um, across all those farms, we've identified uh, 10,233 issues. So it's a lot of, lot of issues out there, um, which is an average of six issues per farm. And Again, no more than the, the engagement piece of it, um, where uh, we ask a farmer to do some actions, um, we're getting agreement on 92% of the occasions. So um, I suppose just to clarify that a little bit, um, our point, is, what we want to do is we want to get a farmer to agree to do something to fix a problem. So, you know, we may suggest a, a mitigation action. The farmer may not agree to that mitigation action, but may agree to the second mitigation, the second suggestion of mitigation action. Uh, so you know we 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 are we get an agreement on the farmer to do something. So I suppose uh, the eight percent is there is is where people, the farmer is not agreeing to do anything at all. So that's just a clarification on that. Um, so just to break down the sector, so uh, of all the eighteen ten farms, thirty one percent are dairy, fifty seven are involved in beef production. So be it sucklers or or calf to beef or whatever. Uh, beef enterprises going on, and then we have sheep tillage and other enterprises are making up just 12% of the, of the farms assessed. And uh, again, this is this is maintained, uh, being consistent throughout the ASAP so far is the uh, the where the pressures are or what the pressures are. So the diffuse 
phosphorus, nitrogen, and sedimentation, those diffuse issues are still by far and away the greatest uh, pressure there coming around three quarters of all the pressures. Whereas, um, you know, the point sources, toxicity, pesticides, and ammonium are down at, five, uh, down at 16, five, 6 and 5%. So I suppose the next thing I just want to maybe highlight to you is the, um, is the, the various uh, issues that are out there and how we do in a farm assessment. So I, I don't think I've actually done this with, with on, a present, on, a, on a webinar yet, but when we go to a farm, we, uh, we look at three different parts of the farm. We look at the farmyard, and this, there's uh, nine areas there and, and, and uh, an option for uh, one that maybe isn't covered by the previous nine. In the land management, we have 23 options, 23 issues that, that uh, we can identify. And in nutrient management, then there's another further 13 issues that we can identify. So there's 46 issues in total that we assess the farm for and try and, and try and identify if there's problems or issues there with regards to sorry storage or silage pits or, or phosphorus loss or whatever the issue may be. But behind each of those 46 issues, we have mitigation actions. So for the slurry storage, we have we have five different mitigation actions there. So that's you know improved management and collection of uh, and storage of farm waste, additional storage for farm waste required, separation of clean grey soil water, dirty water, reduced or destock, reduced stock, or and informing and educating farmers. So there's five options, five mitigation actions that we can recommend to a farmer there. And likewise, we say for phosphorus loss to over and flow, we actually have 21 different options that we can ask a farmer and we can recommend to, to a farmer depending on what the issue is and, and what the scale of it is and, and, and based on the advisor's um, best, uh, best opinion and best knowledge and, and the farmer's willingness to take on the mitigation action. So as you can see, you know, management of critical source areas, riparian buffers, finced and finced and, and so on down the line. So, so there's 21 of those, but in total across all 46, there's a possible, there's a possible uh, um, total possible uh, mitigation actions is 289. So I suppose I, I'm just trying to give the viewer or the listener a, an idea of the scale of, of um, the assessment and the scale of the mitigation action that can be recommended to the farmer. Um, so I think that's uh, worth sharing with you this morning. Okay, so I suppose the next part of this is that each um, issue identifying the farm is assigned a risk. So we try and, we try and uh, you know, categorize these issues into um, three different risk categories. So it's high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. And of all the issues that we have identified, you know, 44% are falling into the high risk category. And I suppose why this is important is, is that the way we define high risk is, is an issue that is that are issues that are likely to have a high impact on water quality. So these are the ones that we are, you know, if we identify an issue with, with uh, phosphorus loss, and we rank it at, at high risk, well then this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. So these are the ones, the high risk ones are the ones that we focus our, our, uh, our uh, effort in with the farmer to try and get some movement on. So we have moderate and low risk. So, you know, our, our, as I said, our priorities get the high risk ones sorted because those ones are having the high impact or likely to have a high impact on water quality. Um, Depends on, on the circumstances, uh, the moderate and the low. Um, we may also ask a farmer to do things on those, particularly with the high status water bodies, um, even though it might be a low, low um, risk issue, even low risk issues can have uh, can have an impact on high water quality or high status water bodies. So you know we have to use our use our local knowledge and our information from Law Pro and making calls on that. So as I said, the focus from ourselves is on the high risk issues and implementation and mitigation actions. Uh, for those. And I suppose just to kind of indicate what, uh, what issues are being identified. So these are the 20 most frequent high risk issues that have been identified. And again, these have been quite consistent. These aren't really changing too much. But I think it's also important to note that these 20 account for 82% of the high risk issues that are out there. These are the ones that are, that are likely to impact. So there's 26 there that, you know, aren't really impacting 26 issues. So it's, it's these 20 that, you know, if, if, if we, when we're going out, these are the ones that, that are consistently impacting uh, on, on water quality or, or put the potential impact on water quality. So you have your peel loss for overland flow, nutrient management planning, drinking points, buffers, organic manure timing, and so on. So those are the ones that, that, that keep cropping up. 
and that's them are the ones that we, we 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 focus on. So I suppose then we know what the issues are. Um, what are the mitigation actions that we're asking farmers to do, and how do we know what sort of implementation is happening around those ones? So again, just just to put a bit of context into what you're going to see in a few minutes, but um, I have a lot of information on on, on the level of implementation of, of actions here, but. Um, just to explain the jargon, uh, actions reviewed. So, you know, these are the, the, the number of actions reviewed by the advisor. So, you know, there the may be more uh, recommended, but we just haven't gotten around to reviewing them yet. Um, they will be reviewed. Uh, not started. So this is where the farmer has not started implementing an agreed mitigation action. So, for example, fencing off for riparian margin. Uh, not proceeding. This is where a farmer would have agreed to a, a mitigation action, but then for whatever reason, decided that he's not proceeding with the mitigation action. Commenced, farmers commenced the implementation of the, of the greed action. So he, he started fencing off the riparian margin, but isn't finished. Complete, this is where the action is complete. He's finished off fencing, or he or she's finished off fencing the riparian margin and ongoing. So this is where the implementation, the mitigation action is ongoing, meaning that it needs to be implemented on a year round basis. So for example, the management of a critical source area. So this is something that you'll never be finished with. So, you know, the, the more the more physical things like fencing or putting fixing concrete slab or or putting the tank or something, that's that's a, a definite finite thing. It's either it's either there or complete or not. Whereas the ongoing one is is more around practice change and it, it needs to be happening all all year, every year, or specific times of the year for it to be uh, to be uh, effective. So. Um, again, just looking at, at those most frequent high risk issues, uh, and I suppose what I was trying to do here is, is just maybe where there has been no action, so that's not started or proceeding, and where there has been action, so this is your complete commenced or ongoing. Um, so there's two things, just a lot of information that, so I'm not going to go through it all, but just two things on this. Uh, the first thing is, is that there is a positive, uh, there, is po there is action taking place, it's, it's, it's more positive action than taking place than hasn't. Uh, taking place if you, if you understand me so farmers are taking action they are doing stuff for us and they are implementing but the second point of it is is that we still even though the farmers are implementing measures we still have a long way to go to get to where we need to you know so we, we have we have a, a large body of work to get get these measures implemented at the level where we can start seeing um you know uh, impacts from water quality so a positive thing farmers are are taking on measures and 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 um and implementing them but we do have a long way to go on that i suppose it's, it's probably worth noting you know a couple of them here that that, that are, are are quite high in 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 the no action con part is is that stream drinking points and stream fencing which wouldn't necessarily be a surprise to us in that um a lot of farmers are reluctant to fence off due to uh due to um uh, issues around having alternative drinking supplies and things like that. Um, just to drill down into a little bit to give you more numbers, you'll be uh, bogged down with numbers, but just, just to show what, what's behind these percentages here. Um, so this is just for the phosphorus loss. So what we can do is we can identify the mitigation actions that I uh, showed you early, early on in the presentation. So management of critical source areas, riparian buffers and so on down along. And we can, we can break that down into, uh, you know, the high, high risk agreed, actions reviewed, and then it's not started, proceeded, and so on, down and on. So that's just to show the level of detail and level of information that we can extract out behind um, each action, uh, each issue, and each mitigation action, and, and, and see how the implementation is going on on that. And the same for, for the other, other, another five there, but I, I won't go through those because I'm eating into Joe Crockett's time here, so I'll keep going. Um, this final thing I'll just show is it just, you know, how does this break down into a into an actual PAA. So and, and how does the whole process work? So um, the Dicer 10 is 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 a water body that uh, is a single uh, water body uh, PAA and it delivers uh, into the Loch Enel, uh, which is um, a, a fresh or a, a lake bathing water um, site um, that has uh, been um, I think, it's, I think it's not a bathing water site anymore, but hopefully we'll be back shortly as a, as a bathing water site. And there will be a number of issues there. So our, our colleagues in, in Law Pro, um, you know, when they did the referral, they identified a number of issues. So diffuse phosphorus sediment loss from poor draining pasture, access of livestock, the main river channel, and damage to the riverbank from, from access and from, from drainage works. 
uh, water troughs, non-observance of, of buffer zones, and application of, of organic fertilizers at a, in inappropriate times and locations. And I suppose um, there, there's a pathogen issue in, in the lake. That's why it, it's not a bathing water anymore. And that would indicate, you know, the, the summer spreading of slurry may be an is issue there. And, you know, typically you would think if you're putting slurry out in the summertime that that would be a, an ideal time. But um, obviously the, the, it's, it's impacting, particularly when you have those heavy summer downpours. So I think that's, that's where that's coming from. And soil water runoff from the yard. So just to give you an ind indicator of, of what, what we've seen there. So the issues identified here, phosphorus loss, so buffers, drain cleaning, drinking points, weather and fertilizer management. Uh, this is uh, around uh, use of herbicides more so than sheep dip, uh, silage pits and effluent, sediment loss and so on down along. And they, those are the, the key that the most frequent uh, selected uh, mitigation action. So there's a big push uh, in this area here around the implementation of buffer zones to protect the water uh, from diffuse losses um, and also you know livestock access and there's a couple of little bits needs to be done around the yards where you have additional storage for farm waste required uh, and what level of implementation has, has occurred there with those. Okay, so just to summarize uh, on the on what you've seen there, so you know we had a COVID-19 has impacted in 2020 um, and a little bit of 2021, but we're, we're out and about now and, and getting very good engagement by the farmers. And, you know, I think it's it's very well worth noting like, that the, the farmers are very much willing to, to have us in and, and to talk to us and to try and do what they can to improve water quality. Um, the pressures and the issues are consistent. So since since we start, I started doing these reports and uh, the first reports, they've remained they've maintained they've remained consistent with the figures. There hasn't been any major fluctuations up and down, which I suppose is is uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, mitigation actions need to be implemented and maintained to improve water quality. And uh, you know if we don't have that, um, we won't see improvements that are are necessary. Um, the implementation has been positive by the farmers, but we need greater levels required. You know, we need to make sure that we get the implementation even higher to see those positive impacts. And the final thing is, is that the, the ASIV interim report, which is which is basically what, you, what I've been showing you there, is due to be published shortly. Um, and uh, watch out for that. So that's that's my lot, Pat, and apologies, I've gone over well over. So Joe, I'm, I'm eating into your time. Apologies about that. <laughs> Okay, Noel, thank you very much. Uh, uh, if you'd stop sharing, yeah, and Joe, you might start sharing. I just know, Noel, uh, I suppose a, a quick question. The, going back to a slide you had there about the uh, uh, level of, of, of uh, implementation of certain actions, there's a number of, of uh, areas where there was a, a fairly high level of non completion of actions. Does ha that have implications for? Uh, I suppose policy or, or, or changes that we need to make in, in uh, how we run the, the program or on the policy side. Yeah, like I suppose one highlighted there was was, was the fencing of stream uh, of, of fences and so on. And look at that. That's something that I would have we would have spoken to the department on. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that's not happening, and and it's it's because there's no you know there might be any alternative water supply. There's a, there's a cost to it. It could be on rented ground, um, you know, things like that. So there needs to be some, if, if we want to, if there's a, an issue with livestock in, in a particular stream and, and um, it's, it's impacting, well, then we, we need to put some sort of supports in there to, for a farmer to, to uh, have an alternative drinking supply and, and, and uh, help the farmer with the cost of that. Um, there's other ones there, but with, with largely around, um, we we'll say, tanks and, and, and concrete works around yards. So I suppose there are grants and there are facilities there. And, and I think what that's indicating is that it's actually the, the, the whole process of getting plan permission and getting uh, that approved and then getting TAMS approval and then getting the work, work done. So it's just the amount of time it takes to do these things is, is probably what's impacting there and those other ones. But um, yeah, like there, there are some, some policy issues there. We have been flagging them to the department and uh, look at, you know, okay. they, no, will do, no. they are indicating they do what they can to help, you know. Okay, Joe, uh, Joe Crockett from Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, if you're ready, to go ahead there. 
Uh, can you see my screen, guys? Is everything um, yeah. okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about to introduce you very uh, tentatively to Dairy Sustainability Ireland, small bit of economics, to mention the ASIP review and then to go on to the broader sustainability issues because ASAP sits within a strategic context and then to set out some ideas and possibilities and just to confirm that what I'm setting out this morning are just some personal views and opinions, nothing more, and then to set out some conclusions. So it's Dairy Sustainability Ireland, these are all the different participants, uh, the primary processing companies on the top line in the main, the different aid uh, associations on the second line and the government agencies on the bottom line all participating. And this kind of stuff that we try to do is to discuss what a bit of agenda setting and to understand what's coming down the track and to try to see can we shape a bit of whole of sector, whole of government collaborative approach, common plans and so on, common understanding, common thinking as best we can. I think I, I, I'm always interested in economics and this is why I got start, got interested in, in, in kind of sustainability in the first instance. So I just want to talk about this for a minute. Um, uh, now, dairy is one of the great success stories of Ireland in, in the course of the past 10 years and particularly in the context of, of of understanding that Ireland was crashed when we had the crash. Uh, and this was one of the strands that the government uh, decided on to expand. And it's been an enormous economic success in rural Ireland beyond anybody's imagining. To the extent that we know that the value of, of, of dairy is 16 billion across the entire country. But the key thing to understand about that is that it is in places that the knowledge economy doesn't touch. Um, so for the likes of, of rural counties where foreign direct investment doesn't happen, dairy and milk product is really the economic pillar that's holding up the towns and the villages and the parishes and the communities and so on and so forth. And there's a multiplier effect that if farmers have money, they're spending it on, on, on goods and products in their area. And it's, it's a huge economic pillar. The market piece of this, the international market piece is also very, very important. Uh, and again, the comparator with Irish drinks that 6.5 billion for, for, for dairy as against 1.4 billion for the Irish drinks industry. Uh, so the question of kind of the market success that Irish dairy has become due to enormously good efforts by kind of Ornua and Board B over long years to, to develop these markets and to make it happen. Um, but there's a, a, a kind of a, the, the reverse of that is that we can't afford ever to lose those international markets. And we can't ever afford that the economic value that dairy brings, that it is lost. And business is a volatile thing. It's sort of what you, whether you buy a pound of butter or a particular dairy infant formula piece. It's a matter of a moment as to whether you pick this one or that one. So we have to protect our market. <clears throat> so anyway, that's the, the, the economics piece. In terms of ASAP, Noel has outlined the principal issues and we, we're working on that together. So we're completely in agreement. And, and again, just to pay tribute to Noel and the Chagas team, they've been outstanding. Um, so in terms of ASAP itself, it has uh, become more firmly established and accepted. And in particular, the principle of collaborative working with farmers and amongst state agencies and processing co-ops to achieve sustainability outcomes. This wasn't quite accepted at the beginning. There was a lot of kind of uncertainty as to whether this is the right approach. And I guess there's still a bit of uncertainty, but generally speaking, I think it's becoming more firmly established. So there's great credit due to the processing, to the co-ops for taking the leap to Chalgisk and to LawPro and to the farmers themselves and to the funding agencies, because this is a very unique public and industry collaboration. This kind of stuff does, hasn't happened anywhere with any other industry in Ireland or with any other set of public agencies. So this is something that's quite new, but it is small. Uh, the, it's only there's only 30 sustainability advisors, 10 from the co-ops, 10 from 20 from Chagas, and collaboration is hard work working with 30 scientists on the on the law pro side because everybody's coming with at, from a different approach, working with the farmers who have a different view, working with the farmers who have a different view. So, so so hard work, but still profoundly the right way to go. But at the same time, the sustainability requirements from the market and from legislators and from citizens has grown ex exponentially. So now we have a, a kind of a very significant sustainability challenge um, across all of the different elements. So <clears throat> I climatise um, uh, under the chairmanship of Tom Arnold and Foodwise under the chairmanship of Dr. Sean Brady, all talked about and proposed um, kind of expansion, but they also said, look, 
you have to be sustainable to scientific standard for market and trade reasons as well as for public policy reasons. Uh, and I climatize has now taken that a, bit, a good bit further. And they are proposing mechanisms by which a significant sustainability change management program needs to be brought forward. And that's kind of the core of my thinking that we need a, a significant whole of government, whole of sector industry, sustainability change management program that delivers change on the ground with farmers to, to, to scientific standards. So in terms of kind of the drivers for that, obviously we're seeing the climate change bill likely to get through the, the Oireachtas next week. Climate Change Advisory Council will be working on its budgets and that the government will then decide over the course of September, October as to how, as to what outcomes they want and, and to start thinking about how it's to happen. But whatever way you look at it, major changes are on the way. The same is true in relation to water. The nitrate derogation application process is underway and major changes expected. Public consultation processes are expected in the next two to commence again in the next two weeks against a backdrop of higher N in water as set out in recent EP in, in the EPA in its annual reports. And I think I'd like to pay to compliment the EPA, if I may, I think that the degree to which they have progressed to science in relation to this is one of the great developments of recent years. So that there can be a lot more precision in understanding what, what's happening where. Uh, and they're really clued in to, to all of this. So I think that the, that the match of precision monitoring is precision agriculture and, and tailored responses to what's needed. In other words, so, so I think that is, that is kind of significant. Clearly the trends in relation to water quality are going the wrong way uh, for, for N in particular and also for P. Uh, and under the Water Framework Directive, they're not really interested. In, the Water Framework Directive focuses on declining trends in particular. And under this EU law, where you have declines in water quality, that signal, that's a big red flag for kind of the EU and, and for national authorities. Uh, it's not enough that water quality is good or half good. That's not what the focus is. The focus is on decline. Um, so that really kind of in terms of where kind of the statutory agencies focus on, that's why the, the EPA highlight the particular trends and that's why the, the National um, River Basin Catchment Plan, or, which, is due, which is done this year, will focus on those sorts of areas. Uh, ammonia, similarly major challenges presenting. We know that agriculture is the main component of the national thresholds being breached, but the technologies around this is helping that quite, is quite a degree. Biodiversity continues to be under threat. In legislative terms, it is declared a crisis. Uh, and then farm incomes. Uh, and again, sort of again, um, it's great that prices for beef have increased this year for farmers against the backdrop of a very poor the kind of market and incomes to, to beef farmers. And milk prices are good again for, for farmers this year, but farm income and farming is a very high risk business because of you know, all the different volatilities at that. So it, it, it's, not a, it's not easy to be a farmer, I have to say. And, and there's so much risk in terms of how much you will make, which is just extraordinary. So then in terms of understanding, how can we adopt a problem solving approach? to climate and ammonia, to biodiversity, and to water. And I think one of the key understandings that one has to have is that you if you start to fix one, you start to fix them all. So for example, if you start to, for example, um, reduce the spread of, of chemical fertilizer, chemical N, that helps the, the climate, it helps biodiversity, and it helps ammonia. The same way if you put in, say, native trees or a belt of native trees between you and a river, between a farm and a river, uh, it helps biodiversity, it helps water quality, it, it helps sequestration. So therefore, every time you do something for water, you actually also, generally speaking, help climate. And likewise, if you do something for climate, you help water. So therefore, I think understanding the core benefits that arise kind of suggests to me that we need, in the first instance, to get best practice out there to a greater degree, a lot more guidance, a lot more knowledge transfer around what are the right things to do around these four um, environmental requirements. So that suggests to me that ultimately what we need to move to is an integrated farm sustainability plan that sets out a menu of best practice for farmers to select in accordance with where they are in their expenditure profile or where they are in their effort or in terms of where they are in their life cycle. Um, and then I think sort of in relation to ASAP, ASAP certainly needs to be expanded, but it is only a pilot program that you can't make it a huge national program because it just couldn't afford the state couldn't afford it 
but I think that really what it look, needs is that sustainability support and advice has to be mainstreamed and it becomes a core part of what Chagas does and the Department of Agriculture, private advisory and the co-ops. It's intrinsic and not separate from the production systems. I think that's a major strategic direction that we need to move on early. Obviously, sort of carbon farming and paying for sustainability, I think it ha has been accepted uh, as a principle by the EU and by national authorities. So the question of paying farmers for their sustainability improvements, I think is accepted. So I think that is to be now brought forward in the eco schemes and, and hopefully as well in relation to sustainability to drive the kind of the fundamental changes that are needed. And I think as well that in relation to the markets internationally or in relation to regulators or in relation to citizens, that people need to be confident that the right things are happening and that there is trust between the farm sector and between um, all these other elements. So the question of kind of having some sort of a system of independent auditing, so that farmers know that, that the right things are happening, that they're having the right outcomes, but that there is trust and that there is no need for, in my view, for kind of hard conflict between the agri-sector or urban Ireland or between policy sectors or between ENGOs, because it is in everybody's interest, both from a market and from an income and from a, from, from a legislative and a public policy perspective that we get this stuff right. So building trust, and building consensus and avoiding hard outright conflict for me, I think is something that's fundamentally needed. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so I'm looking at the science of things, enormous scientific developments are being brought forward at the present time by Carberry in West Cork, by Chagas with the signpost farms, by Devonish. And I think that really what we're looking at is that every farm taking best practice from these different um, models of, 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 of cutting edge developments and every farm going down that direction and every farm assigned post farm in the medium term, I think that's what we're looking at. And I think Carberry and UCD, in terms of winning a two million euro prize from Science Foundation Ireland, was an enormous confidence builder for the sector around to prove that this stuff is doable. And Dairy Gold and Glombia have brought forward our major sustainability change programmes. Glombia one was launched this week, focused on um, carbon reduction. And it, there's a lot more to follow. Uh, so it's a great credit due to Terry Gold and Columbia for those significant steps. So therefore, in terms of looking at the ask uh, from the sector, from Agri, when you look at kind of the Chagas Mac curve, it has three elements. One is climate mitigation on farm. And that is kind of the part that everybody looks at because we're accountable to the EPA budgeting strategy for that. Uh, so that's where the Carberry uh, and the signpost and the Devonish stuff comes in. But that's, in my view, too narrow a focus. We also need to look at the other things that Agri can deliver. So it can do energy in relation to microgeneration with solar. It can do anaerobic digestion. Um, and there's lots of companies out there now doing significant stuff in that area. For example, Dairy Master is doing incredible stuff down in Kerry. The solar energy companies are doing great stuff. And there's lots of, uh, and indeed, uh, the ESB and, and uh, Electric Ireland are doing great stuff there, as well as an awful lot of solar companies, local power and so on and so forth, but also, and then Gas Networks Ireland are doing stuff in relation to anaerobic congestion. So there's great possibilities emerging. Um, but I think also in relation to sequestration, I think there's an awful lot that, that can and should be done by the, by the agri-sector to advance sequestration and for it to be recognized. So these are all the different asks that are possible. So agriculture can become a major deliverer of agri-climate betterment not just for on-farm mitigation, but also for energy and for sequestration. And these would represent a major win for society. And in my mind, they're very deliverable. And that's kind of one of the, the question of, 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 of kind of, again, the problem solving and can we fix this? And, and I won't use the Obama thing, but I think that actually this stuff is fixable. And then talking about water, uh, now, my brief is, is comms and education and, and kind of behavioural change. And again, the question is, how do we solve a problem like nitrogen or excess nitrate? So obviously, what's under examination is additional dedicated asset support and in vulnerable areas, as per the uh, EPA maps. Question of everybody working together to solve the problem, uh, as per the second line. The question of best practice slurry management. Uh, Chagas uh, and kind of the, the idea now is that best practice really is that to get slurry out by midsummer 
if you're to max productivity or and to max sustainability performance. And I think that really is where every farmer should position to get your slurry out by the midsummer. Uh, uh, and then if kind of any soil water gets into the tanks by between now and October, take that soil water out from the best practice and then be ready for what's coming in, in from October. I think also it is appropriate to look at the question of the assessment of slurry storage and to see is the slurry storage capacity right? And then to address the issues that, that present from that, if there are any, uh, and then in particular to adhere to the closed season. And I, I know that there's lots of questions as to whether the closed season are right or wrong, but Pat Murphy uh, or the Chagas people will tell you that the science completely supports complete and full adherence to the closed season. I think nutrient management planning, the implementation of that is critical. Uh, and then the question of protected urea, all fertilizer sales linked to hard number, the use of clover, multi-species wards, the use of less, all these things are, will, will, will be major elements. Uh, Columbia have proposed a water quality farm plan per farm in excess years, and that's profoundly right. And it's part of that integrated sustainability plan per farm, which I think is where we're getting to. Tillage is also a contributor to in excess in, in, in particular catchments, uh, uh, and that is something that also needs focus. The other bits you can see there on the screen. So then in terms of kind of closing out the, con the conclusions, and I just want to slow down a little bit here just for two minutes. Um, so what we need for climate change and for water quality and for EU directives uh, and, for, and for market requirements is, is major and impactful change on sustainability improvement to scientific standards, trusted standards. We also have to fix forestry planting rate because if we don't the mitigation that that delivers for land use will fall off in 2030 so that really has to be fixed and i know that they have fixed kind of the, the planting mix to make it far more sustainable and it's great credit due to them for to the, to the department for that and forestry systems so but we need to fix that so i i think this is kind of my main point really that the we need to move away from the question of of, of policy for all of these, these different things into implementation. And we need change management strategies to make this stuff happen. And I wonder whether we need new or refocused national structures on sustainability management and support, uh, because implementation is what matters. Uh, and if you look across the world, it's only around implementation. It's not about what great plans you have on, on the, in the drawer or looking at you. It is about how do you make it happen. To, to outcome and performance standards. So we actually need significant effort. We need coalition building and collaboration to, you know, because there's no point in wasting energy fighting and conflict. We need coalition building, collaboration, working together with the farmer at the center for support, focus uh, uh, and engagement. So in conclusion, Agri, in my mind, can deliver climate betterment, not just climate mitigation, can deliver energy, can deliver uh, sequestration, but it can also deliver water quality, biodiversity, and ammonia success. Now, the question is, can Agri really do that? And we know from Food Harvest and Food Wise that it can. There's been huge success already achieved economically and so on and so forth and export wise. So definitely it is a case of the Obama stuff. Yes, we can. But I think it is key to understand sustainable agriculture as a market protection and as an economic growth requirement not simply as a policy and as a regulatory requirement. It is needed for economic protection and development as well. But the principles we have to use are that it's collaborative, problem solving, phased, resource, resource, and that there are metrics to trust the standard. And that then delivers the sustainable agri that we all need for the farmer, for the market, and for public policy success. But we can only do it if the same processes and support and energies and direction that delivered food wise and food harvest are delivered now and applied now to sustainable agri. Thanks guys, sorry I went on a little bit more. Right. Okay, thank you very much Joe. Uh, just ask Noel and, and Eddie maybe to uh, join us back again uh, and uh, if you'd stop sharing your, your presentation there Joe. And just give me a moment please. Okay. Uh, just, a, I suppose, a, a couple of quick questions. Noel, you, you I suppose you're, what you're saying to us is, is ASAP is working, it's working in the current areas for, for action. Uh, there are potentially a lot of areas outside the current areas for, for action where water quality is, is not good. Is there a plan to expand into those areas? 
in the future? Yeah, so I suppose um, the where, where ASAP came from was it was the second river basin management plan, and the that that had a you know I suppose it, it set out what they f they felt was manageable in it. So that's where the 190 PAs came about from. But um, I know the the third river basin management plan is due for publication. Um, you know, anytime soon, and in our the draft third river basin management plan is due for publication very shortly. And I know a lot of work has been going on or in the background trying to identify uh, further uh, PAAs to expand into uh, that are that are have uh, issues with water quality. So um, yeah, I, I I think you know first and foremost um that there is a there is um ambition to uh, expand to further pas where there's water quality issues uh law pro um are, are are you know part of that process and ourselves as well and and you know there's a big wide consultation process around identifying those um those water bodies with local authorities and 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 the public as well so yeah look at i think what we have done so far is is you know it's 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 been it's been good um we have a long way to go yet as, as everybody knows um you know the indicators report there the other day just you know showed a slight improvement in water quality and uh, maybe you know some of that may be attributed to, to work going on in paas but look at we're, we're very much trying to get the trend going in the right direction and then try and build on that momentum and that trend uh, and try and add add to it so you know the third river based management plan would be a key part in delivering that so we'll, we'll wait and see what what is, in, what is in that in the detail of that but yeah the plans are there to try and uh, build on what what has been happening so far with regards to that focused paa um by paa work that law pro are doing and that asap uh, and and local authorities as well you can't forget those they, they they are working as well in in various pas around the country so between all that, you know, you, you, you're hoping that that momentum can build and that we can get improvements um, going um, at greater a greater pace and greater speed into the future. Yeah. Uh, just remind people that the, to use the the question and answer uh, tab to to put in their questions. Joe, I suppose a a, a a question. There's some people may be cynical about the intentions of the the dairy industry. How serious is the dairy industry about achieving uh, sustainable dairy production? Well, we can only be as serious as the state is. Uh, um, so if the state is serious about sustainability, then the dairy co-ops will be. Now, the dairy co-ops also have to be serious about sustainability because that's what the market wants. And uh, when uh, in relation to kind of the, 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 the value of the economic exports and the value of kind of the check to the farmer and the value of share prices to, to those who are PLCs, all of these are linked to our sustainability performance in the future. And even in relation to kind of funding mechanisms across the world now, they're all kind of now looking at kind of sustainability performance. So this is not an avoidable or a fudgeable issue. There really has to be hard performance and hard success in these areas. That lines up with the export performance and the, you know, the, 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 the success we've had internationally, as I said, that, that Ornua and Board Via have driven. So this is not an avoidable issue. This really genuinely has to be fixed. Okay, uh, Eddie, some questions coming in. Yeah, there are there are plenty of questions coming in, which is which is excellent. I suppose just to start off with some spe specific ones, and one came in very timely, Joe, um, just when you were dis uh, discussing uh, slurry management, and they're thinking, can can you give, and I'll address it to, to both Noel and Joe, three specific key measures that would be uh, considered most efficient: three for nitrogen, and three for phosphorus. What, 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 what do you think? I'll hand, I'll I'll hand over to Noel on that because I'm not, I'm, I'm not a farm guy. Well, Joe, Joe actually, uh, I saw that question coming in and, and Joe was actually talking about some of the, the, uh, the measures when, when that question came in. So, you know, um, story storage uh, was, was one of the things that you were mentioning there, having adequate story storage and, and the closed period as well. And uh, adhering to that, but I suppose you know it, it very much depends on what kind of soil you're in. And I see another question further down about phosphorus and feedlots to overland flow. Um, so you know if you if you have you know a, a, a nitrogen issue, well then you're in the more free draining soil. So then you have a different set of, of actions that you need to focus on to to uh, deal with those, um, as opposed to a phosphorus uh, issue 
which would be a heavier soils issue, and then you'd have a different set of actions that that may be more more important there. Um, so just from the nitrogen, you know, I, I think certainly think the slurry management and, and the usage usage of slurry and and that um, winter period, uh, early spring, late autumn period, those are crucial periods of the year where um, where we need to be very careful on how we manage our slurry or manage our nutrient inputs our nitrogen inputs, inputs, our chemical inputs. So I think, you know, we, we will need to get much smarter and much more reactive to the weather conditions. So, you know, soil temperature, uh, soil moisture deficit, what the growth rate is on your farm, those kind of things are going to have to be played a part in whether you decide whether you should go with nitrogen um, or sorry, in, in, in the early part of the year, or should you delay it a week or in days or whatever it is and that that will vary from year to year and it will vary from parts of the country and it will vary, vary from farm to farm um i think then you know the autumn period of the year as well same same kind of thinking going on there what's the growth rate what's the soil moisture deficit what's what's the, what's the have we've had a very dry summer um you know is there going to be a lot of natural mineralization of nitrogen there if there is do we do we dial it back on, on the chemical in and the other thing then is is you know we're, we're it's a lovely day here in galway you know it's been even for Galway, it's been it's been sort of semi. Uh, we've had a very dry spell, not an awful lot of rain. Um, in other parts of the country, they may be in drought. Uh, depending on the soil moisture deficit, there you should be dialing back on, on on your nitrogen as well. If the growth rates are dropping, you know it's it's it's, it's important that we're reactive to that. So those are the kind of things that I think um, we need to look at, as well as 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 trying to replace chemical fertilizer with the likes of of, of clover and the likes of multi-species forbs and things like that. So. Those kind of combination and the use of less, those kind of combination of things would, would help in the nitrogen one. The phosphorus one then is 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 a heavy soils issue where you have uh, heavy rainfall and, and and the soil gets saturated and water flows over land. So then you're you're looking at a different kind of set of parameters there. You're looking at trying to break that pathway and and prevent uh, nutrient from leaving the field and getting into the stream. So you're looking at trying to identify your critical source areas. And the EPA have brought out brilliant maps there recently, um, which identify kind of you know, critical flow path areas in your in your land that that where water uh, can can move and and, and kind of flow over land. So those those are the areas that you'd be looking at. Maybe trying to you know slow down that flow or, or intercept the the sediment uh, or to prevent the nutrient from getting in. So you know, and again, nutrient management and and how you manage your land then is very important as well because you know if you if you uh, spread slurry in, in a field that that can get very wet and and flood. You know that that's only going to end up in one place, but I think most farmers, in fairness, uh, um, know their wet fields and, and try and apply sorry in, in the drier fields because you know uh, sorry tankers are heavy and they don't want damage in their land. So those are the kind of things that you'd be looking at, um, Eddie. And and no, no, thanks very much. So I think there's a lot of scope for for uh, management of organic manures tying in with good nutrient management planning and and they kind of overlap and tie in together for both nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah. So also, I, I know with the ASSA program, you get direction, you're working in priority areas for action, which have been identified by uh, government agencies, Law Pro and the EPA and, and, and so on. And you get, you get uh, a desk assessment uh, be, before the ASAP advisor goes out. But um, I, I find for behavioral change, it's very good to give feedback where improvements have happened. And, and, we've seen, and there is a question there, is there any measured specific improvement in problem catchments and I'm wondering do you get feedback from Law Pro where there has been an improvement and is that feedback given back to the farmers and can you give an example of any such improvements? I don't, yeah they, yeah like I suppose it's it's still very early uh, to um, see improvements. I know in the in the indicator report you know they're, they're, they're saying that you know that, that the areas where PA, PA areas where there's been a, a um, has been a greater level of interaction that you know that the level of improvement is is slightly but greater there than it would be in in the in the non PA areas. So obviously there's, there's something going on there that's impacting and improving. But I suppose what we're trying to do from a, from a behavioural change point of view, or contacting farmers or informing farmers, is that you know we 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 have a kind of a plan where we you know at the very start of our work in a PA we we reach out to all the farmers to come along to a meeting. Fortunately, a lot of those have been over Zoom for the last 12 months, but hopefully we'll get to have them in person again. Um, and uh, we set out a stall, explain what we're about. And midway through, then we we also 
uh, give some feedback as to what the issues are and what the pressures are and and, and what what mitigation actions are, are recommended on that. So to reinforce that message to, to them that this is what we're finding. And then, you know, when we, you know, hopefully towards the end of the year, we'll be finishing up on a couple of PAs and we will, we will obviously invite all the farmers back to a further meeting to give an indication as to uh, what has happened in with regards to water quality. Uh, so a law pro would, would be able to provide some information around that. So I think it's very important that that you know uh, farmers are, are kept in the loop as to what's going on. Like there's nothing worse than coming in all guns blazing and, and then disappear out of sight. Like I mean that that's not good enough and that's not what we won't be doing that. We want to we want to keep the farmers in the loop and um, you know hopefully by the time we're finishing leaving that water quality will have improved and that they know what is impacting and what they need to do to keep it improving. And, uh, you know, hopefully that will lead to fundamental practice change by farmers in that PAA uh, and that, you know, we, we'll be able to maintain it as opposed to having to go in again in two or three years time and, and restore it again, you know, hopefully we'll be able to, to maintain it at, at that level. You, you mentioned all hopefully, but, but there will be fairly exact uh, um, measurement of exactly what's happening in the, the catchments that you're you're working in so it's not as if we're we're or there isn't going to be a, a fairly high level of measurement the question yeah. here um in relation to the engagement of of other advisors uh in water quality uh uh and working with the asset advisors yeah i think joe actually kind of touched on it again in, in joe's piece uh where he, he spoke about um it becoming main you know water quality issues and that becoming more mainstream you know uh, and uh you know i i think that that's that's a very laudable uh, suggestion and idea and you know if, if an advisor is going out talking about um grass measuring or breeding or, or dosing or whatever it is that they also, you know, always talk about an environment issue, be water quality or biodiversity, or greenhouse gases. So, you know, it's 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 part of the conversation, uh, and it's 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 the norm. Um, so we've we've been working with, uh, you know, trying to uh, engage with with our colleagues in Chagas and, uh, you know, through uh, upskilling them through the derogation courses that were run and uh, um, things like that. That we're we're we're. Trying to, you know, we, we, the advisor advisors are in across all the regions, so their job is is obviously to to work with the farmers and the PAAs, but also to bring along the the, the child advisors and help uh, raise their knowledge around water quality and the issues that are impacting on water quality, and to try and and bring that to to a wider audience as well. So you know, through the discussion groups and. Uh, you know, uh, so on. So look, at the, there's plenty of work going on there to try and, and upskill the, the advisory service. But I do think that, you know, it's, it's something that needs to happen on a national scale as well, maybe with, through uh, CPD, compulsory uh, professional development through the department. And I know that's something that they've discussed and maybe have plans uh, in, in place for to try and uh, bring the wider advisory body of whatever, seven, 800 advisors up to a certain standard around the environmental issues that are out there. So that they can all deal with them. Okay, Eddie, some more questions? Yeah, a very, very simple and straightforward <laughs> question. Do, do you feel that the nitrates derogation helps or hinders water quality? Not such an easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah. Very, very um, so look at um, that that the nitrates derogation is is what's there at the minute from 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 the, from the point of view of, of what's permitted. Now, I know that the derogation review is ongoing there. Um, I think that, you know, water quality, um, nitrogen levels have, have increased in, in, the, in the rivers. So you have indications there that there's excess nutrients getting out. Um, so it's very, you have to be very careful how, how we reduce those those numbers and there's a number of ways of doing that which we've already spoken about um i think you know the discussions between the department and, and, the, and the european union are going on with the derogation and i think we could all expect that there'll be changes there as well to, to the nitrates derogation um it won't be what we have currently you know i think jack nolan has as well as the department have flagged that there's going to be uh, changes there so look at i think those changes will, will come in and will you know they're designed to to improve water quality so we'll have to watch this space and see 
uh, are they going to deliver on that? Okay, folks. Okay. Sorry, that we're we're going to have to bring it to a, to an end. We've we've come up time as as beaten us. Uh, listen, thanks again to our our two speakers, to to Joe and and to Noel for excellent presentations, to uh, to Eddie uh, for uh, assisting with with questions. Uh, at this point, I know we normally thank our production team, Andy Boland and Yvonne Marr. If you might uh, uh, turn on your cameras there, just so that everybody can can see it. The two of them are are, are with us here. This morning, uh, I think just to, to acknowledge the amount of work that goes in uh, from Yvonne and, and Andy to keep this uh, moving and, and to keep the, the uh, webinars going out on a weekly basis has been colossal over the last year and a half. And they are continuing to, to work ahead with, with plan schedules right out to October of this year. So thanks again for, for all the work. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.